Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our workshop, Navigating Follow-Up Reports and Visits. I want to uh, let you know that uh, closed captioning is available in your Zoom menu bar. And we have two interpreters, Sarah Blattberg and Sarah Wheeler, who are working with us today. Please uh, pin the interpreter's video. Again, their names are Sarah Blattberg and Sarah Wheeler. Thank you for doing, working with us today. Again, this is a workshop on navigating follow-up reports and visits. This is uh, our disclaimer statement from the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. I remind you that this presentation you are viewing has been prepared by and is the property of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. Reproduction, distribution, or transmission of the presentation in part or in whole is expressly prohibited without prior written consent from MSCAG. And I want to call attention to the last statement, which is this presentation is not intended as a substitute for professional advice from MSEHE staff, and use of the presentation does not guarantee any specific accreditation outcome. My name is Igna Corbett. I'm Vice President for Institutional FIA Relations, and with me today is Dr. Christy Faison. She is our Senior Vice President for Accreditation Services. These are our learning goals for today's workshop. After participating in the session, participants will be able to understand commission actions, which request follow-up, understand the types of follow-up, which may be requested, understand the expectations for each type of follow-up request, prepare and submit follow-up reports, understand the purpose of follow-up visits after submission of reports, work with institution stakeholders to prepare for the follow-up visits, and work with the team chair to develop the agenda for the visit. And finally, we should be able to plan to host a follow-up visit. This is a reminder, this is a screen that most of you have seen this slide many times. This is just a quick reminder as a background uh, about our accreditation review cycle and monitoring for institutions seeking reaffirmation. You might recall we begin with the self-study evaluation visit. Four years later, in that eight-year accreditation review cycle, we have the midpoint peer review. And then after eight years, the self-study the self-study evaluation. So this whole thing starts all over in the review cycle. A follow-up may be requested as a result of any of these three but we also have what is called ongoing monitoring activities. These ongoing monitoring activities happen every year or the years in between, depending on what is requested. The, uh, as you can see, the annual institutional update is, a, is an annual, is a yearly event, but then part of the ongoing monitor activities is the follow-up reports and visits, which is what we're talking about today. But we also have a different kind of follow-up called recommendations responses. And Dr. Faison is gonna be talking about those today. In addition, there may be some out of cycle monitoring activities, not resulting from any one of these other accreditation events. These may be supplemental information reports and we will talk about that, those reports today. Now I'm passing it on to Dr. Faison for the next section of this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Corbett, and welcome everyone. So one of the first questions you might have is, why did I get a follow-up report? So you will see on the screen some of the reasons that the commission may request follow-up. For example, after a review, if your institution was planning a new initiative or a new initiative was recently implemented, the commission may request follow-up so that it can have assurance that those activities that were planned or implemented are being carried out. 
Sometimes the commission will request a follow-up report because there is need for improvement. And the commission needs evidence that the appropriate improvements, improvements are being made. On a more serious note, sometimes the commission has concerns about whether or not the institution is in compliance with either a standard, a requirement of affiliation, one of our policy or procedures, or federal regulations. That would be another instance when the commission would request a follow-up report. And finally, for institutions that had been in non-compliance, once the institution is returned to compliance, the commission will ask for a follow-up report to ensure that any corrective measures that were put into place have been sustained over time. Anytime you get a request for a follow-up report, it will always be aligned with either one of the commission's standards for accreditation, requirements, policies or procedures, or federal regulations. You see on the screen the seven standards for accreditation and commission actions, whether they denote noncompliance or reaffirmation with follow up, could be aligned with one of these seven standards. Let's look more closely at follow up and the standards. The chart that you see on the screen now shows non-compliance actions that the commission took between 2018 and 2019 and the standards that were associated with the non-compliance. You will look at the purple area and the green area. The purple denotes standard six, which is planning, um, finances and institutional improvement and standard seven, excuse me, standard, I'm getting these all confused. Let me start again. Standard six, purple, planning resources and institutional improvement. And the other area represents standard five, which is our assessment standard. So you can see that an overwhelming number of our non-compliance actions related to these two standards. However, with the exception of standard one, all of our standards have led to non-compliance. But you can also get follow-up related to reaffirmation of accreditation. So let me tell you a little bit more about those standards. Again, it would be standard six and standard five that have required the most amount of follow-up activities related to um, compliance and reaffirmation of accreditation. If you look at those institutions in the midpoint peer review, follow-up has mostly centered on two standards, standard four, which is the student support standard. And again, standard six, having to do with planning resources and institutional improvement. Finally, Dr. Corbett mentioned an area called out of, out of cycle supplemental information reports. When you get that kind of request for follow-up, they are most often associated with either standard four, which is the student support services standard, or standard two associated with ethics and integrity. Noncompliance is also associated with requirements of affiliation. On the next screen, you will see that these are the, these are the commission's 15 requirements of affiliation. So to be eligible for, to achieve and to maintain accreditation, whenever an institution is under review, you have to demonstrate that you are in compliance with our requirements of affiliation. You will see that some of these are highlighted in red. Those are the requirements that have led to non-compliance. You will also see that one of the requirements of affiliation is highlighted in blue. That is the requirement that has led to the most requests for follow-up associated with non-compliance. And that one deals with resources adequate to support the purposes and programs and to ensure financial stability. We can also request a follow-up related to requirements of affiliation, even when an institution is in compliance. Those two standards that often require follow-up are five and six. 
Both of those have to do with compliance with policies, whether they are policies of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, the institution's own policies and procedures, or those policies associated with the government and other regulatory bodies. Now, how would you know if you would receive um, information that would require follow-up? This would be information that you would receive in a team report. The two boxes that you see on the screen right now, a team report might provide significant accomplishments, progress, exemplary or innovative practices. That does not require follow-up. A team report might provide collegial advice. Those are suggestions based on the professional experience of our peer reviewers. Collegial advice does not require follow-up. The next box that you see says recommendations. If a peer evaluator provides recommendations, that could lead to follow-up as part of a commission action. And finally, if you receive a report that has requirements, that denotes non-compliance with a standard or a requirement, and that will require follow-up on the part of the institution. Let's look more closely at the type of follow-up reports that the commission could request. There is one type of follow-up that is not listed on the screen, but that I do want to share with you. Often, a commission action will ask for follow-up in the next self-study, which means that the commission has confidence that the institution will work on any concerns, but they don't need you to report out until the time, possibly eight years later, that you submit your next self-study review. The ones you see on the screen are the types of reports that could be requested. The first is the Supplemental Information Report, which we call the SIR. When there has been a review, the Commission can request a Supplemental Information Report when it needs further evidence that the institution is carrying out activities that were planned or newly implemented. The second type of follow-up report is a focused report and a focused team visit. Focused reports are only associated with the midpoint peer review. And a focused report is always accompanied by a focused team visit. If the peer reviewers who are looking at your midpoint peer review have serious concerns about student achievement, about viability and capacity, or about the institution's financial health, they could request a focused report followed by a focused team visit. The next type of report is a monitoring report. A monitoring report is associated with non-compliance. It's when the institution has been placed on warning or probation. These type of reports are always accompanied by a follow-up team visit after submission of the report. I would also like to note that whenever there is non-compliance, the commission may request a teach-out plan. They can request it at any time but if an institution is placed on probation, a teach out plan will be requested. The next type of follow up report that you see is the most serious of those that you see here on the screen today, and that's a show cause report. A show cause report is requested when the institution must justify why its accreditation should not be withdrawn. The show cause report is always accompanied by a show cause visit. In addition, the institution would be requested to complete a teach out plan with teach out agreements. If the institution should be issued a show cause report, the institution would be invited to appear before the commission at the time the institution is on the commission's agenda. This is an option that is provided to the institution, not required 
And so the institution could choose to appear or not to appear before the commission. The next type of follow-up are called recommendation responses. These are always requested in conjunction with the annual institutional update. These are narrative responses that provide information about your progress on addressing a concern. And I will give you more specific information about how to respond to a recommendation response within the AIU. Finally, there's what we call the out of cycle supplemental information report. And it's called out of cycle because it's not associated with any particular review. The commission can request a supplemental information report that's an out of cycle report at any time it obtains information that presents concerns about the institution's ability to be in compliance with the standards, the requirements, policies and procedures, or federal regulations and can generate public concern. The commission will request supplemental information uh, reports so that the institution can substantiate any information that the commission may have received. So these generally take the form of information we receive from other accreditors about noncompliance. It could be in the form of a complaint. It could be if the institution is currently under investigation, whether that investigation is internal or external. It could also be media reports that are directly related to concerns about compliance with standards, requirements, policies, and federal regulations. If an institution is requested to provide follow-up and it's related to non-compliance, that will be accompanied by something called a commission liaison guidance visit. A commission liaison guidance visit involves your vice president liaison coming to your institution to provide you with additional guidance in understanding the commission's action and the commission's requests for reporting information. They will explain the commission's expectations and they will provide guidance in helping you to put together your follow-up report and host your follow-up visit. Your vice president liaison could come alone or could bring another commission staff member or one of the commissioners at the time they conduct the visit. One of the first steps in responding to a request for follow-up is making sure that you understand the commission action language. And so I'm going to go through several samples to help you interpret and unpack the way the commission relays to you that a follow-up report is needed. Looking at the language on the screen, the first few words say to request a focused report. So as soon as you see the terminology focused report, you will understand that this is associated with the midpoint peer review. So this has been the opportunity for peer evaluators to look at trend data related to student success, finances, and viability and capacity. They also look at your AIU recommendation responses. In this request for follow-up, the commission is asking for a focused report, which means there are serious concerns and they're asking for improvement of key indicators of student success. So they want to know about your retention and graduation rates, evidence that there is improvement there, published information regarding student achievement and student outcome measures, that points directly back to your website and your provision of information about student achievement made available to the public and to students. This one also requests financial planning and budgeting aligned with mission and goals, and that's directly related to standard six. So the first thing you want to do is unpack the commission action, determine what type of report has been requested what the specific recommendations are and review the standards or policies or requirements aligned with that request. The next example specifically asks for a monitoring report. So when you see the request for a monitoring report, 
you know that it deals with an issue of non-compliance and that the commission has determined that there is non-compliance with either a standard or a requirement, a policy or a procedure. When you are responding via a monitoring report, you need to demonstrate that you have returned to compliance with the standard, but there will also be some specific areas that you should concentrate in that are enumerated in this action as sufficient learning opportunities and resources to support students and faculty, fiscal and human resources, physical and technical infrastructure, and documented financial resources. So you're not only responding to the standard, but you're paying particular attention to those recommendations enumerated in the commission action. And again, a request for a monitoring report will be accompanied by a follow-up team visit. The next example that says to request that beginning in 20 whatever year and in conjunction with each annual institutional update those are the keywords that let you know that this will be recommendation responses. So each year, when you complete the annual institutional update, you will be apprising the commission of your progress in addressing the identified areas. In this case, strategies to measure and assess the adequacy of your institutional resources and evidence that assessment results are used in planning and resource allocation. Finally, if you get a commission action that begins staff active, that is a clue that this is an out of cycle supplemental information report. All other actions come directly from the commission, but staff are able to issue SIRs at any time. And so we don't wait until there is a commission meeting. We uh, ask for that kind of information at the point we become aware of a need. So in this case, it says staff acted on behalf of the commission to request a supplemental information report. And it again will be aligned with the standards and the requirements. Now, if you read this, you may not actually understand what the commission is asking for. Fortunately, with the request for an out of cycle supplemental information report, you will receive a letter from your vice president liaison that outlines the issue. They will tell you if it was related to a media report or another accreditor or an ongoing USDE investigation. So the actual letter will provide you with information. What you see on the screen is the commission action that will be on your statement of accreditation status. Finally, the commission could ask for follow-up related to policies and procedures. There are numerous policies and procedures. So if your action language specifically states a policy, the best thing to do is to go to our website under the policy tab and browse by the title of that policy and then read the policy and procedures in their entirety. The policy will give you an overview, general information, but the procedures will give you detailed information about the expectations of the commission in complying with that particular standard. The final area that I would like to address is the request for recommendation responses. As you recall from the sample commission action, whenever you see the request that says in conjunction with the annual institutional update, this is the request for recommendation responses. So at the time that the AIU is open for institutional submission, you should go to your institution's portal page. At the top, you will see a tab for recommendations. If you click on that box, the recommendation, the standard, and a text area will be open for you so that you can provide the recommendation response. In this area, the institution should provide a narrative response. It's 6,000 characters, and that includes spaces. So that equates to roughly one to three paragraphs. You cannot provide hyperlinks, and there's no opportunity to upload evidence. 
So you are really telling a narrative story about any progress you have made in addressing the recommendation. And you can focus on accomplishments, outcomes, action plans, benchmarks, assessment results, the results of data trends, any information that you would like to provide the commission so that they have assurance that you are addressing the concerns. These responses, which are offered year after year, are reviewed by peer evaluators at the time of the midpoint peer review or the self-study evaluation, whichever review process comes next. As I mentioned, these responses are iterative. So you will have several responses before a peer evaluator reviews them in their entirety. It's quite possible for you to respond that there was no specific action taken that year. However, when the peer evaluators look at the cumulative responses, it is the institution's responsibility to make sure that they have demonstrated sufficient progress so that the peer evaluator can make a determination whether the recommendation responses have been addressed and are no longer necessary or whether they should be continued through the next review. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Eatna Corbett to talk to you about other follow-up reporting mechanisms. Thank you, Dr. Faison. Let's talk about the follow-up reports. All the other types of reports uh, fall into this category. And as you saw on a previous slide, there is a document on our website called out the follow-up um, guidelines. And those are the ones that you would want to take a look at very closely, aside from the follow-up from the accreditation cycle and monitoring policy and procedures. A question that we often get, as you can see, you saw in the samples for the uh, commission actions, they are calling out specific things within the standard. So the question it always, I, I, we always get asked is, do I need to address all the criteria in the standard cited by the commission action? I remind you that at middle states, there is no partial compliance. It's either compliance or non-compliance. So when we cite the, uh, the specific standard, you are addressing, you, you need to demonstrate compliance with the standard. However, because the commission action specifically asks for certain things, you must pay particular attention to those recommendations or those items that are listed in the commission action. You will do the bulk of your report will be related to that. So how do you organize the report, whether it's an SIR or a monitoring report or a focus report? First, there should be a cover page. In some institutions, there is even a signature from the CEO saying, I have seen this. You have about five pages to do an introduction. In the introduction, you will provide context so the reviewer can interpret your report. Remember that with these, with the exception of the monitoring on the focus, there is no team. So with the other ones, you really need to provide a, a context during that introduction. You would want to say, uh, tell the reader about your institution, the size of your institution, the programs you offer, the kind of students that are served, and particularly would be good to include in the introduction, recent history leading up to the commission's follow-up action. Then you would have the bulk of the report would be a substantive narrative and analysis related to the particular standards that are cited in the commission action. You would have 10 pages maximum per requirement affiliation standard or any other issue. Then once you're done with that, you have up to five pages for a conclusion. In the conclusion, you can summarize what you have said uh, let the commission know what are the plans for uh, continuation or sustainability of the corrective actions or anything else that can provide additional context for the reviewer. These reports also allow you to upload evidence. Different from the recommendations responses, 
that do not allow evidence, no links, no attachments, no appendices. This one actually does include, allows the opportunity for providing evidence, which is uploaded to the portal. Now, in the case, in the particular case of an out of cycle SIR, you will provide appendices up to 100 pages that are part, so it will be a single PDF. So if you have received one of those out of cycle SIR actions that begin with staff acted on behalf, then it is one PDF document and it's 100 pages maximum. But any of the other reports, you can upload evidence to the portal. You follow up report, then should document systematic evidence. This is not about, you know, this one program is doing this and that's the only program that is complying. You need to show that there is systematic evidence and for every assertion you have in the narrative, there should be corresponding evidence in the evidence inventory. You should provide evidence of consistency across operations and academic offerings. This is particularly important when you are cited, for example, for standards three, four, five, or six, where you need to show, for example, in standard five, that assessment is conducted consistently throughout all operations in standard six, that institutional effectiveness is assessed throughout all units. You should provide evidence of current and sustainable compliance, processes and results that have been implemented, not just plans we're going to, but we have implemented this, we have the following results. You need to show that you have structures to ensure sustainability. You have the right people to conduct the activities, the right committees, and all the, the, the right technology. And back to that, and that you have provide, and that you have in some many cases policies and procedures that have been put in place to make sure there's compliance with a particular standard. You should address all items in the commission action. As Dr. Faison showed you, there are different items, you know. You should demonstrate one, A, B, C, two, such and such a thing. So organize the report by each requested item. Organize it according to the standard or according to the requirement. Write the report so that it documents compliance with the standard and the corresponding criteria. And if there are any requirements of affiliation, you should also address and you make sure that you are connecting the standard with the corresponding requirement of affiliation. As with any report that you submit to middle states, you should do an analysis. Don't expect that the evaluators will do the analysis for you. So what does that documentation mean to you? How far have you gone in terms of compliance? What are the next steps that you need to do to sustain compliance? You need to provide documented evidence. Assertions are not good enough. A couple examples without documentation are not good enough. Every statement that you make should have a citation or a documentation. Everything that you say for every paragraph, there should be some evidence in either uh, in the appendices or in the evidence inventory that provide documentation that corresponds to what you're saying. The answers without evidence aren't answers because the team or the evaluators or the commissioners are going to say, okay, how do we know that this is actually happening? So here are some examples of documentation. So for example, if you have a report on assessment, the commission often looks that there is an assessment structure that is fulfilling its responsibility. So it is not enough for you to write, yes, we have an assessment committee. It is composed of, uh, it, the members are coming from all the different departments. The committee meets every month and the committee, you know, what is the committee doing? How is the committee assisting the institution in complying 
with the commission expectations. It is not about how often the committee meets or how many people are in the committee, but what is the committee fulfilling, is fulfilling its responsibilities. In some cases, you will provide a specific document, such as strategic plan. If you are, if you are uh, writing a report for standard six, for example, you will see the budget allocation guidelines. You will see audited financial statements when they are required. Or in some cases, for example, if you're in standard two, you want to submit the bylaws, a committee's bylaws. So all of those need to be provided in context and you should provide examples, but provide the context and the background for that example. You may also provide documentation that shows when certain events happen. So uh, minutes from a committee, not the whole minutes or you know, a year's worth of minutes, but the ones that specifically address when the committee made the decision. Agendas could be helpful. And also, for example, all, all university or all college um, communication from the president of the provost communicating how a new policy is being has been developed or how new procedures or new expectations uh, for the whole institution or communication from department chairs to the departments, for example. As we have said before, this is not about the future. This is not about what we're going to do with it. This is what have we done? What are we doing right now? What is the current compliance and how are we sustaining that compliance. Focus on outcomes. It is more than just the structures and processes. As I said, it is not just about we have an assessment committee and it meets twice a month. It is about what are the results? What are the outcomes? It is not, instead of asking, do we have an institutional assessment plan? Here it is, what is the plan? you should be asking, is the assessment plan being carried out? Is the monitoring body fulfilling its responsibilities? Are decisions made based on analysis of assessment results? And notice that I use a lot of examples in terms of assessment. That's because as Dr. Faison said at the beginning, standard five and standard six usually um, are the ones that, that may result in, in follow-up. However, as you know, Assessment is included in all seven standards. Thus, we're using that as an example very often. <clears throat> Be forthright and honest. Honesty is the best policy. It is much better to say we're having trouble with this and this is what we're trying to do rather than have the team or the commission committee figure that out on their own. Also remember, we do have a standard about ethics and integrity. So we expect all of our institutions to abide by it. So if there is a problem, explain why. Why is there is a problem? Provide clear evidence of what is it that you're doing. And in the case of recommendations responses, you have several options, you know, several times you could say that, not in the case of the report. So in the report, you need to say what is happening, how do you know that it's happening? What are some of the issues? What part of the issues are already being addressed? And maybe there might be some that are still in progress, but you need to show that there is progress and compliance. So be concise and be well organized. Remember, these are volunteer evaluators that are reading this report. So respect their time and energy. Even though we don't have limits in terms of the evidence, do not do data dumps. Make sure that anything that you're included in the list of evidence, it's something that is directly connected to your narrative. So make the report easy to follow. So you can use subheadings, use charts, bulleted lists. There are many ways that you can make the report much easier to follow, particularly if you have several things in the standard that you need to address in your report. As I said, follow-up reports are usually 10 pages for standards. Use more as needed, but that doesn't mean you're going to use 100 pages. It means if you have several standards, you can then 
do 12 in one and eight in the other, but you really don't want to go beyond the 10 pages per standard. So that's with the report. But once you have written the report, you need to upload it. Reports are uploaded to the secure MSCHE portal. You see on the screen, this is what an institutional screen will look like. And you would click on that green button, reviews. To upload a focus report, first of all, you want to look at that you're looking at the right one if you have had more than one. But if you have only one, make sure that you're looking at the right one. You can download the institution action report you see in the bottom left hand corner. And then you upload it to the report and evidence submission page. When you click on that page, actually there will be another window that will open up where you can choose where you're going to download the information. Please do not forget to click the complete box. You notice that we have some grayed out areas over here. That's because this particular report, they haven't clicked complete. Once they click complete, these other areas open up so you can continue to get information and upload information through the portal. If I had a nickel for every time, I have to say, did you click complete? Oh yeah. So make sure you do that. So other types of follow-up reports, not the focus report I showed earlier. This is in the case, for example, of a monitoring report. A monitoring report, as Dr. Faison said, results from a non-compliance action. So this would have been the institution, over here on the left, that would have been the institution action, you know, and the history report, all the actions in the last 10 years. You would upload here, report and evidence, and then you click complete. And that's when you see the next, because monitoring reports usually, you know, they, they require, always require a team, when the, team is a, when the team has been identified, you'll be able to see the team roster, affirm the team roster, and after the visit, you'll be able to see the team report. Again, don't, don't forget to click complete because without clicking complete, you will not see the end part, which is the actual commission action. You've written the report. You're done. Now we're going to conduct the follow-up visit. So we'll go. Um, with some detail about the follow-up visit. So they are required when an institution is a warning, probation, or show cause, okay? These are to um, schedule, these are scheduled to ensure that all the documentation, which is the team report, the institutional response, and the chair's confidential brief need to be completed at least two weeks prior to the follow-up activities. We should have reminded you that just like with the evaluation report, the team report is not the end of it. It actually goes through the three-step uh, review process that the commission has. So you have the team, the team visit, and those reports go to the, in this case, to the committee on follow-up activities. And then the committee makes a recommendation to the commission uh, on what action it should issue. The team may request additional information. So you may have provided a lot of information when the team reads your report, they think they may think they need to see something else. They can request for additional evidence before, not after the visit. That is a mistake here on the screen. Before or during the visit is what we meant to say. And you are responsible for uploading the additional evidence to the portal. You will see when the team issues their report, they will also include the list of documents that they have reviewed that are currently not in the portal that you will need to then upload to the portal. And what you do is look at the portal for the additional documents link. So the follow-up team is assigned by the commission according to our policy and procedures related to peer evaluators. The number of uh, evaluators, the expertise will depend on what is the standard being addressed. So if it's a standard three, 
then we would have somebody that is expert on academic affairs. If it's standard five, we'll have somebody who's an expert in assessment. If it's standard seven, which is usually related to resources, we will always have a chief financial officer or somebody, uh, somebody expert on finances and so on. This is also one of the few cases then when the VP for your institution actually goes with the team and the, the uh, commission staff or the VP liaison accompanies the team to support the team and to provide interpretation and clarification of policies and procedures the staff member is not an evaluator, it's a support in this process. So when you plan to follow up visit, <clears throat> they are usually one to two days only. One day of interviews, and then the second day is when the oral exit report is done. The team chair will consult with the ALO <clears throat> or the president, whoever is um, identified by the institution, they will consult to determine the visit schedule. In this case, uh, the team chair would consult with the CEO and many times with the ALO, with the Accreditation Liaison Officer, to determine the date. And then usually the Accreditation Liaison Officer will take over to work on the details, like the agenda for the visit. When the team is identified, you will, just like you would for an evaluation report, you will submit the follow-up uh, report and that follow-up report will be according to the action. Remember those actions that we included earlier to request a such and such report Do So it needs to be uploaded on that particular date. And then after that date is when the commission then identifies the team. The peer evaluators then will visit and interview the campus constituencies, those interviews will depend on the particular standard that is being addressed. It is not like a regular evaluation visit. They meet with a lot of people at the institution. They will meet only with the people associated with that particular uh, purpose of their report. So during the visit, just like any other visit, the evaluators clarify the information, they confirm and verify what was submitted in the report. Different from the evaluation visit, there are no social events expected during the follow-up visits. It's only the team may arrive the night before, they conduct the interviews in one day, depending on how complex the visit, it could be more than one day, and then the day after would be the oral exit report. What does the schedule usually include? On that first day, the team will meet with the president or CEO. They'll meet with the governing board, the unit leaders according to the standard. And very often they will also have open meetings with faculty and open meeting with students. The second day, the first meeting is our team chair with the president or CFO. And then there's the oral exit report that you're used to. I remind you again, we do use this multi-level decision-making process, which I said we should have said earlier rather than now. But uh, as we've said before, the peer evaluators are the first step. Then uh, their reports go to the committee and follow-up activities. And then their uh, recommendation then goes, their proposal for commission action goes to the commission meeting. And all of that because the Middle States Commission on Higher Education is concerned with consistency, equity, and fairness in our evaluation processes. One thing I, I, I remind you again, the team produces our report, but also the institution produces an institutional response to the report. So that you will need to pay, pay close attention to because when you click complete after submitting the report, after reading the report, you will see the card where you upload the institutional response. So we're your friends. Your VP liaison is your friend. If you have to submit a report of any kind, please note that your VP, your VP liaison is available to talk to you through email 
or telephone. And now that we're doing so many video calls, we're all available. When the time comes and we're able to, we could meet in the commission offices. There are times when the institution requests a campus visit. This is fee-based, but they may be very concerned and they may want the Middle States uh, uh, representative to come speak to the campus and provide further guidance in addition to the commission liaison guidance visit that it's already that has already been described. And one thing I remind you, we cannot review your drafts. We can provide recommendations, but we will not be able to review the draft or provide specific feedback on what you have written. We are now, we have 10 more minutes, good, for submitting questions. So um, if you join on your desktop, you will see you can use the chat. And we have already, um, what I'm going to do to make it easier to see the chat. So this is also how you can submit your questions if we are using uh, a phone. But I'm going to exit and stop sharing so we can look at the chat more easily. And Dr. Faison, do you help me out here? Yes, I'm going to help you out. So one of the very first questions is, will we be providing a copy of the PowerPoint to today's uh, attendees? And the answer to that is yes, you will get a survey for today's uh, webinar and it will provide a link to the recording for uh, today's uh, follow-up reports and visits. So Eatna, we have another question. It says, following a self-study report and peer team visit, who decides whether a follow-up report is necessary, the commission or the peer team? The commission. The peer team may include that, the, the uh, chair's confidential brief may include that, propose that, but it is the commission, the committee of the commission and the commission itself who decides whether a follow-up report is necessary and what kind of follow-up report is necessary. The only exception are the out of cycle SIRs, which are prompted by the staff. I wanna clarify the question from Nereida about the difference, you know, the two weeks as opposed to the six weeks. Um, this is what I meant is that all of the documentation, the team reports, the institutional response, the chair's confidential brief, all of that must be available two weeks prior to the committee meeting. In this case, the committee on follow-up reports. This is different from other cases. Now, I think what you're talking about is that visits have been postponed and you, have, you are providing updates. And those are the updates that we are asking uh, that you complete and they be, be available to the team six weeks prior to the visit, which is very similar to the evaluation reports because you need to have uploaded your, your narrative and your evidence six weeks prior to the team visit for the evaluation. So that, that six uh, week time is the same. The, the, the two weeks refers to the committee meeting. Okay, I have another question that says, we have been asked for a supplemental information report as an action from our reaffirmation of accreditation. I will upload the report by the 15th of December. Could you tell me the process after? Now, assuming that that request for a supplemental information report did not include a visit, your report will be reviewed by the Committee on Follow-Up Activities at its next meeting. And then that committee will propose an action for the full commission. And that action will be taken at the commission meeting. So assuming you mean 15th of December, 2020, the follow-up committee will meet at the end of January and they will propose an action that will go to the March, 2021 commission action. And that is where the action will occur. Mm -hmm. Okay, Eden, I'll throw the next one to you. If a team report does, do does not download, does that imply it's not yet available? If the team report is not available, 
according to the deadlines provided to you. So you as the ALO should have received, along with the team chair, a list of deadlines for their reports. And that usually comes from our accreditation services unit. And these days it's probably either coming from Kathy Ortiz or Aaron Matson. If they are not available according to those, the, those deadlines, then you should contact support at msche.org first. And please copy us, your, your VP liaisons, because we, if there is some issue, sometimes it may be an issue with the portal. Sometimes it may be that the team chair has not uploaded it yet. So please contact your VP liaison, but just in case it is a portal issue, contact support at msche.org. Thank you, Edna. I have a question here is where can we find the dates when the commission meets regarding the self-study? The commission meets three times a year. They meet in March, June, and November. So it depends on the date that your institution hosted a visit. If you refer to the self-study guide, which is available on our website, it will explain the timeframes for the visits and the next commission meeting according to that timeframe. You can also reach out to Accreditation Services, Ms. Kathy Ortiz, and you can ask specifically which agenda your institution will be on if you need additional assistance. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going hey. to answer. Go ahead, Ina. Yeah. I'm going to answer a question about, you know, uh, the question is, you have a whole lot of majors in your institution. You have a very complex institution. Can you provide an ass assessment summary on all of them? 100 pages is not enough. That would be true. That is why we ask you to provide examples in the narrative and also select examples to provide in the evidence. And if the team decides they want to see further examples, they may ask for additional documentation. So if the issue of assessment is assessment, you may provide following the standard. Uh, you may provide examples uh, from different levels, different credential levels. You may provide examples from different departments and different types of programs. In some cases, you would want to have you know, uh, examples from programs that are external, externally accredited, example for programs that are not. So you select your examples, provide the documentation in the evidence, but then the team can always ask for more and they will let you know. Okay, Edna, we have another question from an institutional representative that says their institution was supposed to host the self-study visit last spring, but it's delayed until the fall. What happens if they get AIU recommendations this spring? Would they be required to report progress in spring of 2021? And yes, depending on which commission meeting you go to, you could be requested to provide recommendation responses beginning with the AIU in 2021. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, remember that we said, you could say that we have not addressed this response at this time because you will have multiple years in order to respond. Yes, so assuming that you go to the March commission meeting and that's where the, where the commission action has been issued, the next AIU opens up in April. Correct. So, but you have had time from the, uh, to, um, it will very likely be the following year, right, Christy? Not that particular year. That, that is correct. Short. Yeah. So someone's asking about using hyperlinks in the SIR. You cannot use hyperlinks that are external to the document. You can use links that move you throughout the uh, document that you have provided, but no external links. You will either be uh, submitting a bookmarked PDF um, or you will be submitting a report and using the evidence inventory. Um, you can also always check with our accreditation services unit to find out more information about uploading reports and they can provide any assistance that you may need. Yes, uh, something I probably should have said when I talked about their report. A, number the pages. 
it is much easier to the team to talk to each other if there are numbers on the pages. B, bookmark that PDF. Make sure that it's easier, easy for the team to find. Consider the team as you are writing your report. Um, an appendix of 100 pages with no uh, bookmarks on the PDF makes it very difficult, and particularly if it has no, no uh, pagination, no, no numbers. So make sure it is clearly, they are clearly labeled. And um, if you are submitting evidence through the, you know, for any other report through the additional documents, make sure you have a clear naming convention so that it's easier for the team to identify. Of course, the evidence for this would be much smaller than it would for, for a regular self-study uh, report because you are usually concentrating on one or maybe two standards. So still make it clear so it is easy for the evaluators when they see the list that they know exactly what they're looking for. So even though we do have a couple more questions, but we have hit the three o'clock hour. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to suggest that you can either uh, submit those questions to your vice president liaison who can respond and they will know the specifics of your institution. And you can always outreach to Eden and I if the question is specifically related to something we said during today's presentation. Eden, I'm okay. throwing it back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know we have lots of people in this group, and so I'm just going to take 30 more seconds to thank you for your interest and your participation today. Thank you to our interpreters for the work with us and for uh, the team in the background, Ms. Victoria Clark, who's in the background helping us with technology. Thank you, Dr. Faison, and everybody have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.